Hi there, you've reached S.J. Thomason with Christian-Apologist.com. I came upon a video by Paul Agia, who is a former Christian turned atheist who lives in Canada, who entitled his video, The Morality Challenge for Christians. And I happen to love studies on objective morality. I love debates about objective morality. So I was interested to hear what Paul Agia had to say about this question. And I also wanted to hear what his challenge would be. So I'm gonna go ahead and play part of this video, and then I'm gonna give you the Christian response, or a Christian response. Let's listen. First, let's define morality, simply as evaluating actions against how well they will achieve some desired goal or outcome, a method of determining that some actions are more favorable than others. I hope that- Let's note that the definition of morality that Paul Agia selected is something that's not a common definition. The common definition of morality is a distinction between right and wrong, or what's considered good behavior and bad behavior. What Paul Agia did was to smuggle in the idea of the seeking of a desired goal or outcome. He decided to stick the consequentialist notion into this morality. And he did that because he knows that if we have objective moral values and duties, they must be grounded in something. And he is going to try to make the claim that our morality is grounded in a consequence. In a little while, I'll tell you why that reasoning is flawed. That works for everyone. Second, I frequently hear Christian apologists assert that moral evaluations would be impossible in a universe where God did not exist. As Frank Turk explains, I mean, if all that exists are materials, how do you explain goodness, righteousness, and justice? You can't. They're not made of materials. So atheists can know goodness, righteousness, and justice. They just have no explanation for why those things exist. Third, the Bible indicates that God's moral laws are written on the hearts of every person. There are some basic principles of right and wrong that everyone knows, whether they will admit them or not. This innate moral code is what drives even non-believers to sometimes act morally moment to moment and feel guilty when they do not. Now, we're going to assume for the moment that all of this is true, even granting some sort of objective nature to it, which isn't really part of today's question. I'm going to call this Bible morality, for lack of a better name, and represent it here with a yellow circle. Even assuming that this yellow circle is the best and objectively right moral system, you must acknowledge that many people make their moral choices based on some other system, as flawed as that may be. They may use a moral framework described by some other religion, or maybe some cultural ideology, or maybe they're a psychopath whose moral evaluations exclude everyone but themselves. Let's build on that. Academic studies across the globe have found that we have commonalities in the human experience. And this is something that transcends time, transcends generations, and transcends cultures. For example, all humans know from some studies that we should be benevolent. That's the number one value across all studies, according to Shalom Schwartz. The number two value is universalism. Now, benevolence means caring for the in-group, whereas universalism means caring for the out-group, or animals, or the environment. Other studies of major world religions and atheism and humanism have identified some key characteristics that all humans share. One is that we seek meaning and purpose. We wanna do something that's greater than ourselves. Another thing that we care about is the idea of the golden rule. So no matter which religion you come from or atheism or humanism, we have this idea that we should follow the golden rule. Now what's interesting is Paul Ogea mentioned psychopaths. And psychopaths occupy about 1% of people on the planet. So it's not a very large population. But recent studies of psychopaths have found some interesting things. One, psychopath the actually corresponds to people who make the decision in the trolley dilemma to kill one person in favor of saving four other people. So this idea of the trolley dilemma is what they call utilitarianism and people who are higher in levels of psychopathy would make that particular choice. So they make the utilitarian choice, which is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And that's a form of consequentialism. Also studies of psychopathy have found that psychopaths do indeed know the difference between right and wrong. They just don't care. In a fallen world, you'd expect fallen evaluations. Some philosophers who think about such things claim that when it comes down to it, humans generally evaluate actions in light of reducing harm and increasing well-being. And because we are a social species, that the further we extend these considerations beyond ourselves, to family, to tribe, to nation, to species, and so on, and extend them from short-term to long-term time periods, the more success we have in surviving. For the sake of discussion, imagine that this blue circle represents a moral system that wants to maximize well-being over the longest term and over the greatest scope of beings, and so will evaluate actions purely according to this criteria. 
We know that the real world is messy, and we could ask a lot of interesting questions. And perhaps this is vastly inferior to the yellow. But all we need for now is that blue is a theoretically possible evaluation system that evaluates actions against maximizing well-being. It Interestingly enough, Paulogia never defines well-being, so we're kind of left wondering exactly what definition he has in mind. Sam Harris has looked at the idea of maximizing pleasure as being consistent with maximizing well-being. I'm not sure if that's the view that Paulogia shares. It should be clear that when evaluating potential actions, some actions will be moral in the blue system, Others will be moral in the yellow system, and some actions will be evaluated as moral by both systems, and that agreeing overlapping area we will represent by green. Note that the diagram isn't attempting to depict any kind of relative scale, only represent the existence of these regions. And now we can get to the challenge expressed in my tweet. Challenge to Christians. What is an example of something in the yellow portion that you think most non-believers would agree with instinctively, presumably because it is both objectively true and written on our hearts? In Good question. So I'm going to address that in the next part of this video. We call this portion, The Emperor Has No Clothes, an investigation of the merits, Apologia's consequentialist morality. If we have universal and objective moral values and duties to do what's right, a moral lawgiver that transcends humanity exists. Two, based on the studies that I've cited to you, which are from people like Shalom Schwartz and Robert House and, and others, Kinnear and others out there, we do have universal and objective moral values and duties to do what's right. Accordingly, we have a transcendent moral lawgiver, God. My friends and I on Twitter were discussing Apologia's video, and I have a couple of quotes from them that I'm sharing with you now. Jansen Lee Gunn said, he's effectively saying the Bible doesn't make any moral statements that don't come under the well-being side. Everything the Bible states morally is also stated naturalistically. Eve Kaninen had a few things to say. She said, the problem with this kind of argument is that atheists avail themselves to moral principles which one are true, two, but to which they have no justification to appeal to. Because they are saying true things, they create the illusion that they are saying things which are justified or derivable on atheism. She also said, the problem is that well-being absent a transcendent ground is just another arbitrary selection. What if someone doesn't care about well-being, but about, say, the nobility of the human race? Nietzsche does, but to maximize nobility requires slavery and immense suffering. She also pointed out that this is Feynman's painter error because he purports to get morality out of science. He just has to start with a little morality at the beginning, but please don't notice this. So what is Feynman's painter error? In Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, physicist Richard Feynman tells the story of a painter he met who confidently insisted that he could get yellow paint by mixing together nothing but red paint and white paint. Feynman naturally found this claim highly dubious. As an expert in the physics of light, he knew this should not be possible. Still, he was open to hearing the guy out and being proved wrong. So he went and got some red paint and white paint and watched the painter mix them. Yet just as Feynman expected, all that came out was pink. Then the painter said that all he needed now was a little yellow paint to sharpen it up a bit. And then it would be yellow. Needless to say, the painter's procedure was completely farcical. Obviously. He had done absolutely nothing to show that yellow paint really could have derived from red paint and white paint alone. It would be ridiculous for someone to say, well, I don't know. After all, he did get pretty far along the way with just red and white paint. He only needed to add some yellow at the very end. So that's at least good reason to think that somebody, someday we might be able to get all the way to yellow paint with just red paint and white paint alone. We need to just keep mixing red and white in different ways for a few more years and see what happens. The use of the consequence to say that the outcome in the consequence is the same as our grounding or our source is circular reasoning. The source or grounding cannot also be the consequence or the outcome. Let me put this another way. The dependent variable in a regression equation cannot also be the independent variable. For example, well-being is impacted by other variables. Perhaps these independent variables would include a person's wealth or family, marriage, psychological state, job satisfaction, etc. But you see the independent variables are not the same as the dependent variable. You can't try to use these interchangeably. In other words, the beginning of a story cannot concurrently be the ending of the story. Or to put it another way, the effort you put into your work cannot also be your resultant performance. Again, these are all examples of circular reasoning and why Paulogia's reasoning is highly flawed. 
And he's not the only one who's come up with that reasoning. I've heard that from multiple atheists, this idea of consequentialism. It's something that Sam Harris initiated in his book, The Moral Landscape. One thing that humans do share is we have these moral intuitions. We make decisions based on reasoning, and we use our conscience often to guide us. Christian Cinderesis speaks to that. For example, if I were standing at the edge of a pond and I saw an alligator inside that pond, which would be quite common in Florida, and then I saw a little boy running towards the pond and the alligator about to lurch out at that little boy, my intuitions tell me to flee. Of course, that's survival. That's basic gut instinct. That's what I would do over generations. That's what people have done trying to escape from lions and tigers and bears and everything else. The intuition is to run. However, the conscience overrides the intuition. And this is something that Christianity uniquely explains in the Bible in the passage, which Paul pointed out. Another thing that's unique about Christianity, when you compare it with other religions in the world, is Jesus. Only Christianity has Jesus, who was God, made into man, who came down for us, and suffered, died, and was buried, and then on the third day rose again. Jesus said, greater love have no one than this, to lay one's, down one's life for one's friends. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That was something that Jesus did for us. Goes against our intuitions for survival or that kind of thing, but it speaks to this idea of conscience. We knew that an innocent person could make the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, in order to save the greater part of humanity. So what Jesus did on Calvary was to reconcile God's perfect mercy with God's perfect justice in the ultimate show of love. And that is one way that Christianity is unique and is a unique moral system. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and please like and subscribe and do choose to come again. I try to make videos a little bit more often, so I hope you'll come by. Thank you.